All right. So I've continued uh, a little bit uh, with the with the skin. Um, we had quite a good laugh when we put on the other part of the uh, the model because all the work that we've done on the arms will be not visible. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was good to explain you guys uh, how to to place uh, the uh, the light reflection. And if maybe you're doing a conversion, yeah, you know, um, it's good. Also, it's also always quite interesting actually how to highlight those um, parts like like the arm here. Um, I did it quite drastically, so so you can see that. Um, next thing we will paint is that uh, crab-like hand. Mm -hmm. um, we will use the same colors that I have on the palette. Uh, I want them to be very dark and with a kind of purple. So I mixed some of the turquoise with uh, some of the Mephiston red and a little bit of black. You can see on the palette cam of creating a small gradient uh, from black to purple. This way I can just easily pick up the color that I need from the palette. It's uh, especially a good trick if you're not very sure about um, what color to pick if you want making a small mistake. Mm -hmm. So this way you can just go back and like in Photoshop with a color picker you just get the right color to correct your mistakes. Um, I'm starting with the purple from the rather the dark side of the transition here. And it will work element by element. That might be a little hard to see actually because the dark colors on black foundation Always a little hard for the camera to pick up. Not I think I think at this stage it might be a bit tricky to see, but I think maybe later on once you start to add more colors, it will yeah. become become more visible. I think that's something that that maybe that like if you were to do that now on your own, you might paint it and think, oh, that maybe I need to do another layer. Yeah. But but really, you don't. It's just not having the confidence to know to know that it's fine just just to move on. Yeah. And some white on the tip of the brush. Now, is there a name for this technique? <laughs> <laughs> the famous loaded brush technique invented by us. <laughs> <laughs> so, and a very important thing when you want to get like the, the glossy look are the, those small, uh, like specular highlights. Like that here, just tiny transition. Just you have the main light is just a small dot of pure white. Mm -hmm. just, and this this kind of comes back to what we were saying before about different um, different ways that diff uh, different textures will have a different reaction to light. Yeah. Here on the top, we will just soft it out a bit more. When you um, you you said you first came up with this with a, a dirty brush, yeah, and that was how you first got the idea. When you'd actually had the idea, okay, so I I put the tip of white at the end, and I have the the base color in the brush. Was there anything that you found um, difficult when perfecting the technique? Um, something that maybe might might help other people out there that are practicing it now? Mm -hmm. I think the, the hardest thing is actually really getting the consistency of the paint right and the the amount of color that you actually put in the in the tip. Uh, and the, the, the pressure of the brush. Yeah. Oh yeah, a good thing we were talking about this off cam. Uh, it's the 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 pressure that you apply on the brush is quite an important thing for the loaded brush. Um, you need to apply more pressure in the beginning to make the highlight color really uh, stay on the on the surface, and uh, then while pulling the the brush back, you have to reduce the the pressure on the brush um, because that way the paint can mix on the surface. 
Mm -hmm. Also, the bristles spread in a different way depending on the pressure. So uh, getting that right is quite important as well. Um, you can see I've used some a little bit more red here for this side of the, the claw and added some white there to get a different color reflection so that it looks as if the material changes its color slightly. Like, like an actual crab would yeah. that they, they have on their skin. Uh, skin? Shell? <laughs> Shell. Shell. There we go. Um. So I will do the same here on the upper part because I think it's a little bit more visible here mm -hmm. on a larger surface. So first purple. Just a little bit uh, red in the brush, so just getting a bit more of a turquoise. But that's a, that's okay. No. Yeah, I want the red to be more on the lower part, so ah, okay. the upper part should be more purple. So yeah, just like that. Yeah, you could probably um, add a, add a touch of blue into that purple, maybe to uh, to, to get like a blurple effect, maybe. <laughs> 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 no. Uh, yeah, we might add uh, some blue on the other side, but 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 never the two. But hits. never the two. Together. <laughs> never, never cross the, the streams. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm blending it here, and just leaving the the top white uh -huh. from the highlight. And then some of the the red here for the lower side. Okay, and with a clean brush, feather it out to the top. Ah, okay. And yeah. feathering something that I've I've heard of, thought I've understood have watched a couple of tutorials recently and realized I haven't understood it. <laughs> um. Feathering out is a very important step actually to to get a smooth transition without these like we used to call them coffee stain borders. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And that's that's something that, that I used that I struggle I struggle with a lot. So we let that dry for a second so it's easier to see. Some uh, small highlights here in the rather red area. Also try to pick out like little uh, holes or indentations here. Um. Something like that you, you could you could miss, but to add to it now it, it, it really gives it that extra something. It it shows that there are like you know different variations in the in, in the, the, the claw. Yeah, it also again gives uh, some like uh, we will also here just do some dots rather than try to blend it over the surface. That should give us a more natural surface because the um, although it's very beautifully modeled, it's still a plastic model, so you don't have all that fine textural detail. So it's important to for different parts to play a little with that as well. More red here. That was. Are, are you glazing that red in that area? Yeah. Would you say? I think that's also a uh, nice color scheme actually for if you want to paint a tear in it, for example. Yeah. Because it looks very dark and... I was, I was just about to say, even if you were painting um, like a, a galaxy effect, yeah. even, you, you, could, you could 
could do something like that. I, it's something that, that I would love to be able to paint successfully and have tried and, and failed miserably on many occasions. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you could do it the very same way for an uh, for something like an Eldar cloak or something. something like mm, that. Have you have you seen James uh, James Wapples done some fantastic Eldar with like yeah. these, these galaxies on the faces yeah, yeah, yeah. that are just like ah oh, beautiful beautiful miniatures. Right, and as we said earlier, some blue in there, but not <laughs> overlapping too much with the purple. Um, we just mix some turquoise with uh, some black. And one day, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, one day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to convert you. So we'll just try to, to apply it here on, the, on that area. When you um say say like now for the, for this miniature you're you're painting, do you um do you pick like one light source to work with? Do you do like um, Kirill was saying, like to paint as if the lights in a dome? How, how do you approach mm. approach a light source? Good question. Usually, I try to to paint it with a simple zenta light, so just light straight from the top. Mm -hmm. If I want to make it a bit more interesting. I just tilt it a little to one side, so it's it looks better for, for example, a non-metal reflection if the light is slightly tilted. To make the the shadows more, um, to, yeah, to, to increase them, maybe. Yeah, also to have a more dramatic shadow on one side to the other, it it's just adds a little bit more interest. Plus, you can better put a focal point on the miniature. Uh huh. Um, but it's important once you choose the direction of the light and the light source, the light should come from there. You, you stick All to it. it. Yeah, you yeah. stick to it. So here we have that round element, and same as we did on the arm, we will just put a dot of white in the middle, and then just work our way to the side. Did you just take a bit of the white off the tip there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was done with that. Didn't need it. <laughs> uh, because it was still wet and I didn't have any on the, on the brush. I was able to just take a bit from there. Again, with uh, some purple, we will uh, just work here from the shadows. A bit of clean brush. Just feather it out here to the top. It's really nice if you have the, the blue and the purple overlap in some areas and in other not. It will give you a very nice uh, transition. It's it's interesting to see how how you've got like like you've got blue, purple, and red, and when when you said that originally, I thought there would it would the the contrast would be quite extreme, yeah. you know, like like really bright, but but it's it's very subtle, you know. But it, it, as you turn the miniature, it just kind of works. It all just kind of comes together, you know. Uh, yeah, and I think the the importance here is that you really. Um, work with all the colors and, and, and blend them well into each other and um, just with, with like overlapping layers of paint and have them just like bind together by using just the very same tones in all of the miniature and like on parts of that you can easily use three or four colors without that thing getting too colorful because it's all very dark mm -hmm. usually. Also, the darkness here helps really helps to make it uh, work good together. A little bit more red here. So 
amazing how just that little glaze can instantly just it, it makes it pop, you know. I mean, it already yeah, yeah. pop, but you know. It, yeah, yeah, definitely because it, uh, you reach that point where where the saturation and the the gloss on the surface is just right, and mm -hmm. that's the nice thing about the the glazes. Just a few slight glazes can change the whole thing and have quite a strong impact. And in that combination with the um, that just the very pure highlights that you kind of d uh, dot in uh -huh. um, because the glazes overlap the highlights in parts uh, they get so kind of like softed in into the surface uh -huh. and uh, that will give a nice contrasted feel even if you did not actually do any blending works on the surface like here we just actually placed the highlights and did the rest with uh, colored glazes So maybe here in, in that area to have a separation, I will introduce some of that skin tone. Oh, okay. It only a bit and then blend it in with other colors like the blue, for example. To make sure that that it dries because the otherwise I keep lifting of pigments. It's a very very important tool to have that that hair dry. No 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 really I'm not I'm not. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's it's a it's a really important thing to have. Yeah, and it would be best if it's one that you where you can actually um, decide whether you want the. It to blow in full heat or just uh, this year it got like three different stages. One something, like, keep, something that's a bit more, um, a bit more resin friendly. Yeah, <laughs> good way to put it. Yeah, a resin friendly hair dryer. I mean, even that that you've just used the the. Um, skin color there if, if that that's actually quite a nice effect you could probably have done the main arm that way yeah with the skin color and then glazing down to the shadows mm -hmm. definitely uh i just thought it, maybe it would look too soft um uh, like like too too skin like in the in to the have mood. the whole thing yeah to have the whole same thing in the in that color i think a nice uh combina color combination could also be uh, some, for example, some orange, like a real crab, some some skin blending into orange with mm -hmm. white and a black tip could also look really awesome. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, there there are some crabs that are these color. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Plus, as I want to keep the uh, armor itself quite um, quite classic, corn red and gold. Okay. Um, I think it, that here fits quite well. It's it looks more more uh, fitting to the kind of armor than the, the arm being soft and skin-like. Somehow these orange and apricot tones tend to look soft. I don't know, it's, maybe it's a personal, <laughs> personal taste. Do you, um, do you consider things like focal points when, when make, doing miniatures like these? Um, definitely. Like for example, I was always told that naturally our eyes will go to somebody's face. So yeah. with a miniature, it's the same thing. Like with a, with a person or an animal, you, you instantly go to the face. But as a painter, you try to create different focal points on the miniature so that your eyes dart all around and, and you tend to take in more of the piece. Is, is that something that, that you would say is true? Um, definitely. I think uh, it's one of the most important things you should do when you think about your, your painting project is that you actually have an idea what you want to, what story you want to tell. Uh -huh. And um, I think it's not that 
uh, important when you paint a single figure because that is quite well defined. You 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 will have the face and you will have the emotional all the emotional impact actually is transported with the face expression and the the hands and the mm -hmm. the pose. So that is quite set. You can still change it a bit, but it's nothing really that is interesting. But if you have something like a diorama where you have to arrange different figures together with a background, that is a lot more important. And um, yeah, I think when you want to, at least for me, a good figure is actually a figure that tells a story. So therefore you need to actually have the order of view, so to say. So you, this is the first most important thing, this is the second story. So you have mm -hmm. to work with that. And there's, there's a number of things you can do to achieve that. So for example, with atmosphere, um, if, if you painted it in a way that would depict it, um, say late at night, you know, yeah. already you're, you're, you're conveying that, it, that it's nighttime and maybe it's a thief or something in a, in a dark alley or something like that. And you, you get that impression just from, from the, the light that you've painted onto the figure. Yeah, also, um, for example, if you have a, a figure standing in the forest and you don't want to build the whole forest space, it's very good just to use some green in the shadows to have that reflection of the forest. Because ah, okay. it will, your brain will just, because you when you see people in the forest, everything is green. Yep. And you will just have that natural understanding of the environment. And yeah, stuff like that is also important when you think about the the uh, composition and contrast on the figure where you want like the spotlight to be mm -hmm. and literally it's like painting a spotlight so you want where you want the attention to be first you paint it higher in contrast and higher and lighter in color these are some really impressive sculpts yeah I mean, they're, they're, they're so detailed and for me really it was it's it's every time actually it's quite astonishing what games workshop uh, creates from plastic because um I think some of the, the other figures, like the resin figures, you, you find really good resin figures from other companies as well, or, or metal figures. But plastic, this is really like the top standard plastic figures. So this is just a glaze with the, with the red pure um, you can see we have like the, the color is changing so we have um, blue red again blue and some red this way we don't have like the, the colors are not really touching each other um, and we have a nice separation of the elements mm -hmm. and really you've just done that through through some glazes and feathering yeah it's it's nothing that, that um, it, it's it's something that with a little bit of practice that 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 isn't totally unachievable. No, it's I think really um, if you just practice uh, your your uh, glazing skills a bit and when to feather color out and when to leave it dry to dry, um, that's really something that uh, you can achieve quite easily. Would you agree? It's it's also a case of of practicing actually um, loading your brush. Um, but but not like loaded rusty, but just uh, how much you actually put on and how much control you have. Yeah, definitely. Um, like like I just did. Uh, sometimes I just uh, put the the brush aside for a second and wipe it off. But uh -huh. I'm not always wiping off everything. I just sometimes I just uh, think, okay, it's too much white, so I just get rid of the tip of the white. Uh huh. And then you can soften it with the base yeah. that's that's still on the brush. Yeah. Also, one thing you have to uh, keep in mind, it's, it's very useful, but uh, you, you can really use it or it can also destroy your blending. The color is, um, depending on where you start with the transition and where you lay down the brush, the color is different from the tip to the back of the brush. So uh, by picking color from the brush, you can also just change it by... Oh, I see. right, yeah. So... Sometimes you, you're happy with the blending and then you touch it with the uh, back of the brush and you get and some it, of the it, dark color in there right. and you're like, ah. But for example, if you pull the brush here over the edge like that, it's quite nice because I can show it. See, depending on uh, here, I have just the back color 
uh-huh. okay, the front color. And the more I blend over the surface, the uh, more the colors would already mix in the in the brush. Ah, okay. Never would have thought of that. So see now I'm painting more with the with the back of the brush to get more of the original color into the mix. It's incredible. And I still have the light color on the top to do some small dots like I did here in the front. Uh huh. Two beautiful tones you've picked there, Ben, like a, a lovely purple and a lovely blue. I think if you were to, to maybe mix equal quantities of that colour, you might come up with something special. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, just having a variation in the tone makes, makes it look a lot more natural. Mm -hmm. And people try, you know, when they base coat things, we were talking about that earlier, when, when you base coat something and you put the whole uh, the solid color yeah the it solid has, color yeah. it kind of stops you from experimenting as well because you're like okay this is going to be skin color mm -hmm. so you have the skin color all over the place by just working bit by bit you but feel skin, more and skin naturally isn't like that it's, yeah, it's yeah. you know you've got the act I mean skin itself is, is a layer and then you have the blood underneath and then so many other little permutations yeah and you have the and the, the light actually scattering in the surface mm. so or underneath the the top layer of the skin so that makes a lot of huge difference like the the ears for example that look more red because of that yeah natural variation is is really the the key to make a like a realistic paint job i think um also that that's that's how i mean light works in nature right it's loads of different beams of, of thousands you know even millions of different cut bits of color yeah and you have types like and our eyes tend to blend them together yeah and so. you have like all different light uh, color colors in the light source itself and the mm -hmm. material color and uh, I think a lot of miniature painters have have the problem that they think either about the material color or the light uh, the light of the color of the light and you get easily lost there just thinking about uh, at, at, at this level maybe not too much though yeah you know because because um, you know you, you don't want to melt your brain too early i mean maybe do that with your your 72 millimeter figure that you've got for a competition that that you know you, but uh yeah, yeah true. For, some, for something like this it's you know, yeah for something like that it's it's a little off but um no i just i was more talking about like general showcase painting mm -hmm. when you think about colors of light and how you want to emphasize what with uh, the the material color and the how you create things. I think you most of the times you either think of one and not how both of those things can work together. And just notice with the, the where I place the the dots of light is just always here at the edges of like the separate elements so I have here the edge here there that will also make the the figure look a lot more 3d and a lot more articulated mm -hmm. um i will keep quite some of that dark here i will just give it a right dark purple purple glaze almost black and i'm not really applying highlights there that will give us later on a nice contrast with the highlights that we put on this element here. Uh -huh. Wow. That is beautiful, dude. Yeah, I'm also really, really happy with the result. And I think this is like half an hour so far. It, and yeah. Even if you, if that would be like the, the, boss of your uh of your gaming table army that would be just perfect to spend half an hour on that yeah absolutely absolutely i think i can say from the the painting community that we we both that, that we love and hate you at the same time that you can do this so quickly <laughs> to such a standard um, yeah but i think it's really due to the the technique and uh if you just practice the technique it's it's really easy to learn mm -hmm. so i think with watching these videos and practicing at home 
this can be easily achieved like with I don't know two or three figures practice mm -hmm. you could be um, just doing the very same um, I'm doing the loader brush I think now for one and a half years uh, where I first discovered it and then started to to perfect it so mm -hmm. it's, it's one and a half two years so um, even I'm not that ahead time wise I think it's important as well if, if you're watching these videos for the first time to not think that you, you will just instantly get it right. Yeah. Um, something that, that when we were talking the other day, you said that, that pretty much 95% of it is practice. And I've, I've heard this from other painters, and I used, it was only up until very recently that I, that I think, whatever, mate, you're just, you were born with a brush in your hand, um, and you can just naturally do this. And then when you say to someone, oh, so, so have you any tips or advice? Yeah, just practice, and you'll get there. Um, but, but it really is true. Yeah. It really is true. If, if you if you stick, I mean, obviously, to, to watch a video like this, you know the correct way to practice. And I think that's the important yeah. thing. Because if you can practice hours and hours on end, but if you're practicing the wrong way, you won't get anywhere. Um, so even if you might not be getting the correct results, if you see a video like this, you know how to practice. Yeah, and, and the nice thing really it. about the videos is that you can also just repeat it. Stop, and stop it and watch stop it again. Stop it and watch it again. Um, I did that with your um, with your basing video. Um, I watched it like I watched it once. Was like, wow, I've got the materials. I can do this, right? I'm gonna do this. Put it on for a second time. Watched it all the way through. Right? Okay, cool. I'm feeling confident about this. Basic yeah. Miller put got all the got everything ready that I needed. Was sat there at the desk, ready. So I didn't have to get up. I didn't have to stop the process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had the video in front of me for the third time, and then just kept stopping and starting going through, winding back where I needed to. Um, I, especially when it came to the wet on wet painting, mm -hmm. I think I just kept rewinding back and back and back and watching every specific area. I just kept watching wh where you would where you were doing the wet on wet. Yeah. Also, the nice thing is that actually the camera is even closer than myself to to the brush, and you, you see the brush yes. is so much bigger than in, in real life. First time I painted on camera, camera freaked mm -hmm. me out because it's uh, everything is so big, and you see all your mistakes. So um, it's so good because you can actually see more than I can see personally. So, so uh, <laughs> what better way to learn? I think that's also a good tip as well for, for your miniatures. If, if you're learning to paint, sometimes you might look at it and, and you've been staring at this thing for hours and your eyes are all kind of screwed up and, <laughs> yeah. and you might not be seeing it properly. Yeah. To stop, take a photograph, maybe go and have a cup of tea, come back in five minutes yeah. and then just look at that photograph. Don't look at the miniature, just look at the photo. Yeah. And, and I your, always, your mistakes yeah, yeah, yeah. will just, or, or the, the bits that you've got right, you'll, you'll be able, they'll come up immediately. That's, that's true. I just um, take pictures of my figures all the time, and on the way to work, I just sit in the subway and scroll oh, really? pics and say, and, okay, I need to readjust this highlight here. I need uh -huh. to get this right. I need to change the colors here. And it really helps me a lot because it's like studying your own work. Uh -huh. It really helps to improve. And I do that actually every day. So, so so yeah, can't uh, go a, wrong with that. There's a good tip from Ben Comets that we've managed to be glad of. <laughs> All right, so I hope you enjoyed the the painting pro uh, progress so far. Um, next part would be uh, the red armor. All right. So this is it. We need your support to keep going, and we kinda need it right now. Hi, I'm Michael, and I'm Ben. <laughs> <laughs> and together we are Painting Buddha. Today, exactly two years ago, we launched our award-winning first product, Season 1.1 Target Identified. For the last two years, we have been working hard to bring you the best miniature painting tutorials available anywhere. We have released beautiful DVD sets, awesome collector's boxes, and with the Painting Buddha Academy created an extensive video tutorial library at an insanely low price. With your support, we have become one of the biggest global miniature painting communities online. Our goal is simple. We are here to help you to be a better painter. And today, we want to say thank you for your support. We could not have done it without you. For over 25 years now, the miniature gaming and painting community has held a very special place in my heart. 
Painting Buddha is basically me living my lifelong dream to give back to the awesome community that means so much to all of us. I have invested a significant amount of funds towards the realization of this dream and as promised I will continue to do so and draw zero salary. Believe me when I say that it took a lot of hard work and sacrifice to get where we are today. We have achieved a lot in the last two years and still have big plans. There is just one thing we sadly haven't achieved yet and that is financial stability. And while we are grateful for all the support we receive, it seems that our business model is no longer sustainable. And that is why we are going to change it today. The success of our free videos on YouTube is amazing. We had over 42,000 views last week alone. Hundreds of messages, mails and comments seem to indicate that you really like what we produce. So here is what we're going to do. You want free videos? Okay, you'll get free videos right here on YouTube. All we ask for is that you consider funding us through Patreon. Patreon is a platform that helps to support content creators like us on YouTube. With Patreon, you can support us starting at as little as $1 per month. And the good thing is that Patreon lets you limit your pledge so that you have full control over how much you spend. Perks included, no strings attached. To celebrate and finance. and finance the Patreon launch, we are running a special Patreon super sale at PaintingBuddha.com. Save up to 33% on our entire range while supplies last. So this is it. We need your support to keep going and we kind of need it right now. So please help us help you be a better painter. Share and enjoy.